Hello and welcome to this episode of Beyond the Readme. Today we're going to discuss two separate but related concepts, the HTTP host header and TLS server name indication, or SNI. While these are fundamental concepts, they are critical to understand if you manage web services. These concepts allow a load balancer or web server to serve multiple domains, which is the norm in today's web hosting environments. First, let's start with a basic overview of the modern web hosting ecosystem. When you use a cloud load balancer or a web service, they're often opaque and they make the assumption that the user doesn't really have to worry about the minutia of maintaining them. This is especially true when you're dealing with complex web hosting environments that use technology such as Kubernetes, where there may be multiple hops between a request and its eventual destination. However, a solid grasp of the underlying protocols and technologies is absolutely critical when maintaining any environment. The modern web is full of pitfalls, and a competent engineer must be able to understand and troubleshoot across multiple layers of the stack. Additionally, concepts such as host header or SNI can impact application behavior and design. As always in these videos, and a common theme in my channel, understanding how things work under the hood is absolutely critical to being a good engineer. First, let me quickly walk you through the environment that I'll be using in this video today. I'm using Nginx on Ubuntu 22.04. Any version of Nginx installed from the normal repositories will work just fine if you want to follow along in your own lab. Let's start by talking about the HTTP host header. If we step back for a second and think about a very simple use case, such as serving only a single website, it's pretty straightforward from a web server or load balancer's point of view. Any traffic coming in on port 80, or whatever port the web server is listening on, can be handled by a single configuration. However, we know that this isn't the case in practice. In reality, we need our load balancers and web servers to service multiple domains. This is where the HTTP host header and an approach that is often called name-based virtual hosting come into play. The host header enables multiple domains to be served from a single web server. It allows the web server or load balancer software to know about the domain that the request is destined for so that it can make an appropriate decision, such as forwarding the traffic to the correct backend application. It's interesting to note that the host header is actually mandatory in the HTTP specification. Even if your web server has a configuration for a single website, clients must still send the host header. Otherwise, they will receive an HTTP 400 bad request from the server. So let's start by taking a look at the host header in action. I have two simple site configurations in Etsy Nginx Sites Enabled. These configurations are identical aside from the server name directive, as you can see here. One is for dev.beyondthereed.me, and one is for qa.beyondthereed.me. In Nginx, the server name directive tells Nginx how to interpret the HTTP host header. When Nginx receives a request with the host header set to dev.beyondthereed.me, it will know to use the configuration that matches the server name for the dev site. Likewise, when it receives a request with the host header set to qa.beyondthereed.me, it will know to use the configuration for the QA site. It's also very important to understand that different web servers have different rules for their default virtual host that will match if no other matches are found. And this behavior can vary based on the server or service you're using, so be sure to review the documentation so that you don't run into any unexpected behavior. I have an entry in Etsy hosts for each site pointing at the IP address of my virtual machine. When I execute curl, it will automatically set that host header to the appropriate value based on the destination of the request. So obviously this works just fine. I'm getting the appropriate website for each request, but let's take a closer look at this HTTP header that makes everything happen. To do that, I'm going to start up a packet capture and retry my requests. Then we can inspect the actual traffic to understand what's happening under the hood. So now I've retried my request and I've captured them in a packet capture. So let's open that up and take a look. Okay, so here I have my packet capture that I just captured in Wireshark. And what we're interested in are the two HTTP GET requests that I sent. The rest of this is TCP three-way handshake, as well as an HTTP OK and normal session management traffic. If we take a look at that first HTTP GET request and expand the HTTP protocol, you can see this host header right here. And it's clearly set to dev.beyondthereed.me. Likewise, if we take a look at that other GET request, we'll see that host header is set to qa.beyondthereed.me. Again, this is how Nginx knows to distinguish between the two configurations. The same holds true for every other web server or load balancer, whether cloud-based or on-premises. These concepts are the building blocks of things like service mesh, where traffic can be routed differently depending on the domain or the host that's being requested. 
And that's really all the HTTP host header is, but it's important to understand what this actually looks like on the wire. I have absolutely seen issues related to host headers. For example, some embedded devices as a security protocol will only accept traffic that matches the host header they're configured to use. This can cause issues if you're going through a load balancer or you're doing any kind of port forwarding. So it's important to be aware that this aspect of the protocol exists so you'll know where to troubleshoot if you need to. So this all works great for HTTP. However, modern web services use TLS for encryption. The HTTP traffic is encrypted as part of the TLS payload. While this is fine once the TLS handshake is completed, it does create a different set of challenges. Web servers and load balancers may serve multiple certificates. It's common and arguably a best practice for each individual application to have its own certificate. Therefore, we need a way for the server to know the right certificate to use before any HTTP or application traffic ever crosses the wire. This is where server name indication comes into play. We can't use the HTTP host header because TLS might encrypt protocols other than HTTP, which is very common, and that HTTP traffic is sent after that encrypted channel is established, so that host header is no good to us during the TLS handshake. This is where server name indication, which is sent before the upper layer protocol traffic, comes into play. SNI is an X509 extension, which passes the server name in plain text during the TLS handshake. So let's take a look at this in action. I've modified my two Nginx configurations to use TLS and some self-signed certificates. As always, you wouldn't do this in a production environment. You would use legitimate certificates, but they'll work just fine for our purposes. I'll go ahead and restart Nginx and I'll make my requests over HTTPS. Okay, I run my two curl requests to pull these websites over HTTPS. I notice I've passed the dash K flag to ignore self-signed certificates. As we can see, Nginx has served up the correct website. Let's also make sure it's serving up the correct certificate. We wouldn't really know that since I've disabled certificate verification with curl, so we'll turn to the OpenSSL command to actually inspect the certificate we're getting back. So I've run this OpenSSL command to connect to dev.beyondthereed.me and spit back out the certificate so I can inspect it. If we come up here and look at the common name of the certificate, sure enough, we see it's issued to dev.beyondthereed.me. So Nginx knows to serve up the appropriate certificate. Let's do the same thing for QA. And once again, looking at QA.beyondthereed.me, we can see that that CN is set to QA.beyondthereed.me, exactly what we would expect. And again, we're using the OpenSSL command here. No HTTP traffic is crossing the wire. This is just the TLS handshake. So let's go ahead and take a packet capture of this traffic to see what the server name indication looks like. I'll start out my packet capture on port 443, and I'll reissue my curl command so we actually get the HTTP traffic in there as well. Once again, we can see that Nginx has served up the correct website, so now let's take a look at the packet capture. So now we have this packet capture open in Wireshark, and the first thing you should notice is that there's no HTTP traffic visible here, and that is of course because we're encrypting that over TLS. We can't view that HTTP traffic unless we somehow decrypt it in Wireshark, which is certainly possible, but beyond the scope of this video. So again, my web server has two certificates on it. When it receives a request on port 443 on its IP address, how does it know which certificate to present to the client? And obviously that's where SNI comes into play. So let's take a look at this client hello message here. If I expand the TLS layer and look under the extensions for the server name extension, we can see the server name indication extension specifies a server name of dev.beyondthereed.me. Likewise, if we open the other client hello message down here, we can see that this request was for qa.beyondthereed.me. So when that TLS handshake is occurring, in plain text, unencrypted, this server name is passed from the client to the server, so it knows which certificate to use and which certificate configuration to use when it establishes that handshake with the client. And this is what enables things like load balancers to serve many different certificates for many different domain names. So let's discuss some basic considerations with server name indication. First, it's not mandatory in the TLS handshake. We saw how the HTTP host header is mandatory. You can't omit a host header, otherwise you'll get an error back from the server. That's not the case in TLS. If you omit the server name indication, then it's going to be up to your server's implementation to determine how it handles that. Usually there's some sort of default certificate that will be presented to a client. As we saw in the packet capture, this server name indication is sent unencrypted, so this obviously leaks information about your requests. Obviously your domain name shouldn't really contain confidential 
data in their naming scheme to begin with, but it's still not ideal that we're leaking information about the requests that our users are making, as that data could be sniffed by anyone that's paying attention to the wire. The encrypted client hello, which is a topic for a future video, was introduced to address this limitation, but it also introduces additional complexities that need to be considered on both the client and the server side. So I know this was a pretty basic video, and many people who maintain web services may already be aware of these technologies, but I really do think this is important information to know about. Over the past several months, I've had to troubleshoot many issues that directly relate to host headers and TLS SNI. Different client and server implementations can behave differently, and you need to know where to look when you're seeing errors. Sometimes these errors aren't easy to troubleshoot. For example, I was once working with an embedded device that would respond with a very opaque error message if the HTTP host header didn't match the host name that was configured on the device. It took a while to debug this issue, but since I knew about the HTTP host header, I had a pretty good idea of where to start looking. Likewise, I've had to debug TLS SNI in cloud load balancer implementations when certain client implementations don't properly send the SNI and the cloud load balancer is expecting it. Again, especially when it comes to cloud hosted web services, the cloud providers try to take a lot of this out of your control, but you're ultimately going to be on the hook for understanding how this works when you need to troubleshoot or architect something. So I hope you found this video useful. These are really fundamental principles in web hosting, and I'm a big advocate of understanding the basics of how these services work under the hood. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like, share it with your colleagues, and subscribe to the channel. I'd really appreciate it, and I look forward to seeing you on the next Beyond the Readme video. Take care.